My main research interests for many years now have been on the function of the frontal lobes and intelligence and, and, and how we solve the complex problems of our lives. And this really all comes from one moment. Um, so it was many years ago, I used to be involved in uh, research on traffic accidents. And a colleague, Frank McKenna and I, young postdocs here in the MRC, were doing research at the London Transport Bus Driver Training School, giving cognitive tests, trying to predict who would do well on the exam and who would then be a safe driver. Complete disaster. We never learned anything useful about that. But I would give them the instructions and then they would know what they were supposed to do and do the whole thing wrongly. And I'd have to go through the instructions all over again. And, and suddenly I thought, and that's exactly what people do after frontal lobe damage of the bra to the brain, which is you know, a curious consequence of frontal lobe damage that you may say to the patient, uh, when I switch on the light, lift up your hand. You switch on the light and the patient says, I should lift up my hand. And they sit there doing absolutely nothing. Somehow they know what they should be doing. They're perfectly capable of doing it. And yet with frontal lobe damage, the knowledge doesn't connect to the, to the action. Yeah, this is a really critical discovery about the mind and brain. And the next 30 years have been spent unpacking that discovery, I suppose. I think one of the, you know, without doubt, one of the things that the human brain is specifically equipped with is massive flexibility. This is why we have been able to do things that no other species could, could um, come close to doing. Um, I mean, I guess any animal uh, tends to represent aspects of the world around them and to behave in a way such as to achieve the necessary goals for their survival. but for all species, I'm sure including us, but much, much less for us than everybody else. This is extremely constrained. You know, a caterpillar on a leaf can really only represent some very modest amount of the world around them, and there's only a small action repertoire that they can choose between. But what's special about the human mind is that we have acquired this brain system, and I think brain imaging tells us a lot about this system, which endows us with the ability to focus on any abstract representation of the world or the universe that we can conceive of and to set any set of goals and plan a course of action that gets us towards achievement of those goals. Uh, and that flexibility means that you can move into a completely new world and you're not completely thrown off by it. Human beings are born as natural scientists. You give a little toddler two toys, for example, they're both interesting, they'll play with both of them, but one of them it's kind of obvious how it works and the other one has got an air of mystery to it. And pretty soon you find it's the one with mystery that the, that the child is playing with and they're doing little experiments on it to see how it will work. Uh, and I think if you think of science in that way, you immediately can get this emotional sense. This is fa absolutely fascinating, trying to understand something that, that previously we don't. And you can see why that would be, because it goes back to what, to, uh, what we were discussing, that. Um, the whole essence of the ecological niche of Homo sapiens is indeed to create understanding of the world around them so that we can manipulate things in the direction that we want them to turn out. So I think that's a natural part of us, but I, also, I think it's also easy for it to get lost under the pressure of ambition, publication and careers and so on. And I think you absolutely must try and hold on to the fact that you're doing this simply because it is terribly, terribly interesting to find new stuff out. And that's, that's certainly what gets me going in the morning. <laughs>